and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Remember in part one when I mentioned those early church leaders, including Ephraim the Syrian? Well, now we get to expound upon the Ephraim Awakening heresy. For anyone who hasn't heard of the Ephraim Awakening movement, it was started by none other than Rob Skiba. So when I looked at what essentially the core of the Hebrew Roots movement is, it's getting back to the Torah. It's understanding that we are grafted into the cultivated olive tree that is Israel. And it is my opinion that it is the awakening of Ephraim from the 2,730 plus years of exile and uh, the, uh, the judgment that the Northern Kingdom received. And when you do the math out, that's in a whole other presentation uh, from 720, 721, 722, depending on who you read, when the Northern Kingdom was taken out. The, the scripture says, if you don't learn your lesson, they had 390 years of initial judgment. If you don't learn your lesson, I think it's uh, Leviticus 26, says that you get seven times more. I'll do the math. 2,730 years later, from 720-ish BC, takes you to, to about 2009. And that's when a lot of people began to just all of a sudden wake up with no leader, nobody telling them, no cult out there to join. They just woke up one day and said, you know what? My Bible doesn't begin with Matthew. Oh, and Galatians is not the only book in my Bible. Huh. What if I go back and start reading a Genesis? And then when you do, you're like, oh boy, there's stuff we got to be doing. <laughs> and so I call it the Ephraim Awakening. Like I've said in other parts of this presentation, Rob's Flat Earth material is excellent, and I recommend it to everyone. However, he was into all kinds of Christian doctrinal heresies, and he wove them into many of his Flat Earth teachings and presentations. The Ephraim Awakening Movement believes that the church is one of the lost tribes of Israel, Ephraim. Followers of that movement believe that they must keep the whole Torah, as if the church were under the law of Moses as one of the tribes of Israel. Most of you don't even say it right. It's pronounced phonetically the way it's spelled, Ephraim. But most of you say it, Ephraim. Somewhere on the telephone game, someone made a mistake, and now you're all just running with it. If you're going to claim to be one of the tribes of Israel, at least pronounce it right. In chapter 7 of Revelation, Joseph is named as one of the 12 tribes of Jewish evangelists who will spread the gospel across the flat earth during the tribulation. The 144,000. If the church is Ephraim, is the church now also part of the 144,000? This is what the Jehovah's Witness cult believes. Do you really want to be lumped together with them? And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Aser were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephthalim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. 
Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. In verse 8 of Revelation 7, Joseph is named, but there was no tribe of Joseph. His two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, were adopted by his father, Jacob. So one son of Israel became two tribes. Joseph became Ephraim and Manasseh. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. Therefore, they gave no part unto the Levites in the land, save cities to dwell in with their suburbs for their cattle and for their substance. And they were full Hebrews, not half Hebrews, like some of you try to claim. Today, Jews are considered Jews by their mothers, but in biblical times, Jews were considered Jews by their fathers. That's why it's Abraham begat Isaac, and not Sarah begat Isaac, etc., all throughout the genealogies. Another example is Moses, who married a non-Hebrew Midianite woman, but his children were considered full Hebrews. That's why he had to have Gershom circumcised before God could begin his ministry in Egypt. God sought to kill Moses for not circumcising his son. And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Zipporah, his wife, was disgusted by the Hebrew practice of circumcision because she wasn't a Hebrew. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. The tribes of Ephraim and Dan are not mentioned by name in Revelation 7 because they were the first two tribes to lead Israel into idolatry. Think about that for a minute, those of you who are trying to be from such a tribe. A tribe whose name God wrote out of Bible prophecy. If you want a full understanding of the apostasies of the tribes of Ephraim and Dan, this article by the late Stephen Armstrong will help. He wasn't King James only, but he was a great Bible teacher. God didn't write Ephraim and Dan out of Bible prophecy, just their names. God didn't break his covenant with those two seeds of Abraham. They will be in the tribulation, but their names lost favor in God's sight. The 12,000 evangelists from Joseph will actually be from Ephraim and Dan, because there is no tribe of Joseph, like I mentioned before. And Manasseh is mentioned in Revelation 7, verse 6. So Joseph here can't be the reunification of Ephraim and Manasseh. And if Joseph here referred only to Ephraim, then the whole tribe of Dan would be completely left out of the 144,000. The church is not Ephraim or any other tribe of Israel. The church is made up of converted Jews and converted Greeks or Gentiles or the heathen nations or in Hebrew the Goyim or the Amim. There was always a distinction between the children of Israel and the other nations even in the design of the tabernacles and temples. Non-Hebrews were not allowed into the inner courts. The reason that sojourners within the nation of Israel were ordered to keep the commandments of God while they were sojourning with them was so that the children of Israel would not be led into idolatry. And if a stranger sojourn with you, 
or whosoever be among you in your generations, and will offer an offering made by fire of a sweet savour unto the Lord, as ye do, so he shall do. One ordinance shall be both for you of the congregation, and also for the stranger that sojourneth with you. An ordinance forever in your generations. As ye are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. One law and one manner shall be for you, and for the stranger that sojourneth with you. But they fell into idolatry anyway. Rob came to this whole Ephraim awakening greater exodus theory when he let his wife talk him into reading the Bible from the ends toward the middle. And they came up with a whole new doctrine from that. Part one, can we trust Genesis? Why would I even ask that question? Well, uh, this is my seventh year of doing Torah cycle readings. Um, you know, where we go through the Torah in a year. This is, we're now in the beginning of our seventh year going through it. And it was probably about the second or third, I want to say it was the second cycle, that uh, my wife said to me one day, she said, you know, honey, why don't, we, why don't we read both ends of the Bible toward the middle? Read Genesis and Revelation and Exodus and Jude and sort of kind of work our way toward the middle. I thought, well, I've done a lot of one-year Bible plans before. That's a unique idea. I've never thought of anything like, okay, yeah, sure. Well, we didn't get very far into doing that when I very quickly realized that Revelation is just an amped up repeat of Exodus. In fact, I put together these uh, Torah study workbook guides and in the introduction of the Exodus workbook, I put together a chart right in the in very beginning of the introduction. It shows the parallels of the, pl of the plagues of Exodus with the plagues in judgments given in the book of Revelation. So I'm like, wow, that's just absolutely amazing because, uh, you know, I'm assuming because you guys are here on, on Shabbat and many of you are Torah observant and, and, uh, that you probably came from standard evangelical background. Some of you may be even dispensational evangelical background. Would that be true? That, that a majority of you probably come from uh, dispensation theology and many probably pre-trib rapture mindset? Uh, who did not come from that background? Raise your hand. Okay, like three out of maybe what 70 or something yeah so the majority of us we grew up in this dispensation background now as you started to move your way into studying Torah did you kind of go through a, a reality check and a little bit of shock and awe when you started to realize who you really were and if you were into eschatology and studying at end times did you realize that most of your library had to go in the garbage or at least be used for cross-referencing to realize how wrong you were. Uh, yeah, I used to be really into end time prophecy, eschatology, all that stuff, and, and you know, Tim LaHaye left behind and all that stuff, uh, you know, uh, have my own charts that I would make up, you know, laying out the end times and stuff like that. And after I started reading Jeremiah and the prophets and going through the Torah and realizing Revelation's an amped up repeat of Exodus, all that stuff's gotta change. It goes out the window. There's a whole different plan. I believe we're looking at a second exodus, a greater exodus, but that's a whole weekend seminar in and of itself right there. And I know Zach's got a lot of work on that. So if Revelation is a retelling of Exodus, then where's the retelling of Genesis? And are John's epistles the retelling of Leviticus through Deuteronomy? It doesn't even make sense to read the Bible that way since there are an uneven number of books between the two testaments. In parts 11 and 12 of this series, I talked more about God's order for the family and what happens when that order is usurped. I encourage you to watch them if you haven't already. Rob also used the adoption of his stepson to further support this new doctrine. Romans 7 through 11 is all about us being grafted into the cultivated olive tree. Ephesians 2 is about us being adopted into the family that is Israel. So when I came off of dispensation theology and came to understand the grafting and adoption process, really as a result of marrying Sheila, because she had a 13 year old son. Well, we got married and I adopted him into my family. They gave him my name. So he was not a Skiba, now he is a Skiba. All of a sudden, Hosea is making perfect sense to me, and where Paul is quoting Hosea in Romans 7 through 11, I'm going, okay, I'm getting it. This is not replacement theology. People want to hear what I'm saying and, and accuse me of a replacement theology. That's not replacement. 
Jeremiah, my son, was a Garcia. Now he's a Skiba. He didn't replace me. He just got grafted into my family and is now heir to whatever my family has to offer him. And, you know, to whatever degree he wants to participate in it, he can pass on the legacy of the Skiba, you know, because that's who he became. He didn't replace me. He became part of my family. Rob misunderstood the concept of adoption according to the Bible. Let's say you have a natural born son and you're going to adopt a new son and let's say they're both 16 years old. But while they were 15, your natural born son took the car out for a joyride at night with a girl while he still had a restricted license and he wrecked it. He wasn't old enough to take the car by himself yet. So you had a rule in place for a certain time until he turned 16, but he broke it and caused a major consequence. You actually had a whole set of rules he was to follow for a certain time until he matured, such as not going out at night, not driving the car by himself, and no dating. But he broke a lot of them so he has a set of punishments coming to him for breaking the rules. And he also has a very severe punishment coming to him for wrecking the car. Are you going to pass those punishments on to your new stepson once you adopt him, when he's innocent of wrecking the car, and innocent of breaking the house rules, many of which never applied to him? Any rules he may have broken before the adoption have been forgiven and forgotten because he wasn't your son yet. And because there are a new set of rules for more mature children in the house. I mean, if I were waiting to be adopted and the deal was, hey kid, we want to adopt you and give you all the blessings of our family, love, shelter, food, protection, education, etc. But your brother here, he broke the old house rules. He wrecked the car. And we're going to punish you alongside him for it. I'd be like, no thanks. I'll wait for better parents to adopt me. You were adopted into the blessings of the family, not the curses. Here's a contrarian perspective that may help. Because I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, my Jewish family now considers me a goy, a Gentile, a heathen, rebellious son. I should have been stoned to death according to the Torah. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard and all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Thank goodness even the most strict Jewish sects don't fully keep the Torah by stoning rebellious children, Sabbath breakers, adulterers, etc. To my family, I have been grafted out of the nation of Israel, or quote unquote, cut off from amongst my people in biblical terms. Ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off. 
his iniquity shall be upon him. That's how they see it. I have lost the blessings of my family in their eyes. And since they get Zechariah 12, 10 twisted up, they think that I will be the one punished during the tribulation, along with the nations, for persecuting Israel, my own people. Look at how the JPS Tanakh breaks standard grammatical rules to keep Jews from Jesus, just like in biblical times. Woe unto you! But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. The reason for the coming punishment, the tribulation, or the great and terrible day of the Lord, or Jacob's trouble, because it's Jacob's trouble, and the church is not Jacob, not Ephraim, is for the salvation of Jacob, the nation of Israel. Let me say that again a little less wordy. The reason for the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. The reason most of you err in your eschatology is because you don't understand who the tribulation is for and why it's necessary. We'll get more into correct eschatology later in this series. God has unfinished business with the Jews. It's called Daniel's 70th week. During that time, the Jews will be punished for rejecting and piercing their Messiah, or wrecking the car from our analogy, and they will realize it at the end as we are told when we read Zechariah 12.10 correctly. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. But the church didn't reject the Messiah, so the church doesn't need to be punished for it. Like your stepson, who didn't wreck the car and wouldn't need to be punished for it. There is also punishment coming to the nation of Israel for breaking the laws set forth in Leviticus 26 for breaking the house rules from our analogy. And if ye will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. The Jews in the tribulation will eventually see the number seven in the seals, trumpets, and bowls, and then they will finally understand their punishment. Contrary to what many so-called truthers and so-called Christians proclaim, 777 is not God's perfect number. 777 only appears once in the Bible, in Revelation, and it represents judgment and wrath. And the church is not and never has been under the laws set forth in Leviticus 26. So the church doesn't need to be punished for breaking them. Just like your adopted son wouldn't need to be punished for what your natural born son did before the adoption, when there were different house rules. If any of the heathen nations were to be called into the Torah, then they would have been called to Mount Sinai with the children of Israel. At best, you could claim to be part of the mixed multitude that left Egypt with the children of Israel in the Exodus, but you have absolutely no way of proving that because they were either completely assimilated into the nation or they completely died out 
while wandering the desert for 40 years with the nation of Israel. The Church of God is not Ephraim. Stop trying to be Jews. Stop Judaizing. Stop trying to replace Israel. We'll get into the replacement theology heresy in part 15 tomorrow. Please like, share, and subscribe. My everything has been shadow banned, and unless you share, no one will receive this message. Thank you for watching. God bless you all. He declared that the evil was the sin for man, and then he decided to destroy the land. He spoke to Noah, and Noah stopped. He said, Noah, I want you to build me an ark. I want you to build it three cubits long. I want you to build it big and strong. I want it 50 high and 50 wide, so it will stand the wind and tide. It's oh, oh, Noah, oh, oh, Noah. Then Noah began to hew and build The ringing of the hammer cried judgment The hewing of the saw cried sin repent A hundred years he hammered and sawed Building the ark by the grace of God When the ark was done, God's voice was heard He said, now Noah, let me tell you what to do Call in the animals two by two So he called them in the ark Two by two, he called the birds The ox with the kangaroo Then he called in Jeff the ham and sham Then God began to flood the land He raised his hands to heaven on high Shook the stars and moon from the sky Shook the mountain, he troubled the sea Hit the wind to his chariot the wheel He stepped on land, stood on the shore And declared that time there wouldn't be no more But it's over and over Oh, oh, no Oh, 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 no God's going to ride on the wind and tide